Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's Washington County Anti-Trafficking Advocates um, virtual Facebook Live. So for those of you who have been following us diligently in person, you know that we aren't able to do that. So we're trying our best to keep our community educated and <clears throat> offer resources and networking and, and we're going to have to do it virtually. So that's what we're working on tonight. I have some new software that I'm working with. So you're going to have to, you know, allow me a little bit of wiggle room if things aren't as smooth as well, things aren't normally too smooth, Matt. I'm going to be honest with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, that's the world we live in. It's okay. <laughs> that's right. You just got to wing it. So uh, I just want to start by introducing our guest and then I'm going to introduce the topic. Maybe I'm supposed to do that the other way around. I'll introduce the topic first. The topic is going to be protecting kids online. And really our main focus is getting people to understand what kind of dangers are out there in, in the, the online world for our kids. I mean, it's the same dangers really for us, but it's a little bit different element. We're going to be kind of focusing on the kids on this presentation. And we really want, I, you know, the focus is going to be on what the problem, what the dangers are, um, what it looks like, what those grooming elements look like so that we can pay close attention to our kids' social media and online, act, online activity. And also what to do, you know, if we find something, and I've had lots of conversations, I've been that parent myself where I'm just in shock at um, what I found on one of my kids' social, you know, on my kids' social media. And I think that we just have this picture of this sugary, sweet, cute kid that's in our household, and we forget that there's a whole nother world out there that's influencing them. And then also, unfortunately, exploiting, looking to exploit them. There's certain people. So, so we want to know what to do. We want to make sure that we're responding and not reacting. Because I can say that I have done the reacting part of it, and it wasn't pretty. And it wasn't appropriate. You know, you get mad, you get emotional, you get angry. And um, things don't get accomplished the way they're supposed to get, be accomplished. So Matt's going to help us here work that, some of that stuff out. And also then resources preventative resources, and then also things that you can um, read together with your family, with your kids, and, and educate yourself, educate your kids. So that's the topic, protecting kids online. And our guest speaker today is with the uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force Director, Matt Joy. So Matt, thank you for um, joining us tonight. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, wonderful. yeah. Say hi. <laughs> yeah, I no, I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate your attention to this topic. So thank you, Wendy. Absolutely, you, you bet. Um, okay, you guys. So if you're online, before we get started, started, I'm just going on my phone here and I'm gonna be following comments. So if people have questions, we are gonna have an official comment section here. Uh, excuse me. Um, time frame for questions towards the end, and. Um, yeah, and I'm not finding this, this live yet, so that's okay, though. No, I'm going to keep looking for it. But um, we're going to have a, a special time just for questions. And, but if you have things in between here that you want to ask Matt or myself or whatever, or comments, um, you can go ahead and well, I'll tell you why that I'm not seeing it on Washington County page is because it's streaming from our Faith and Giggles page, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I connected well, it to the wrong. So what I'm going to figure it out rather quickly, though, is um, I'm going to ask you all to be patient for one quick second because I'm going to go to my Facebook page and I'm just going to let people know to come to this page to view this. I apologize. Okay. I practice this a lot. And as you can see, <laughs> it's still going to be um, it's still going to be posted for people to watch later. But I'm going to go to my page and direct people. Sorry about that. I knew I was going to do something. That's I okay. I'll figure it out here. All right. So yeah, I'm just going to have a little quiet time to talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> Is that okay so here we go 
So I'm going to be telling people, um, yeah. So I'm getting a reminder to go live. I have, an, have a presentation and I'm, okay, so. Uh, all right. I'm just going to step away for one moment then. Yep, go ahead, Matt. Head over to. All right, I'm ready with my charging cord just oh, good. in case. Good. There's a need to do that. For this slide. All right, everybody stand by. I apologize, but you know what? We'll get it together here. Grab a drink, grab a snack. <laughs> 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 we do lots of um, Facebook Lives on Faith and Giggles. So people are used to something. Usually I have a glass of wine by my side, but I'm, I'm doing this with no adult beverages tonight. I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Okay. Pinned from wrong page. All right. Should be okay. So I have people who are going to Faith and Giggle or going to Washington County Anti Trafficking Advocates page. They should be clicking on and seeing that they can come here. So we're going to get started, okay. Matt. Okay. Thanks. No, of course, not a problem. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with a few terms because uh, what I have found in my advocacy work and my ed uh, community education work is it's really confusing all the terms that we, we throw around there. And we tend to think people just know what we're talking about when we're talking about grooming, when we're talking about sexual exploitation, when we're talking about sextortion and sex trafficking, people kind of don't understand the difference on those things. So I guess if you could just start with grooming, can you explain that grooming process, what that looks like? Yeah, um, obviously it's going to look different depending on the individuals that are involved. But um, I will say that the folks who are involved in these kinds of things are master manipulators and they're able to um, they're able to be whatever it is they need to be in order to gain trust um, or some sort of a, a bond, if you will, um, with the people that they are victimizing. So if they need to be a shoulder to cry on, if they need to be um, to fill the vo a role of a parent, if they need to... Um, you know, be the person that uh, they're going to share secrets with. Um, they're going to figure out what it is they need to be. If, if someone they want to be a more of a friendship role, whatever it is they need to 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 be to to gain trust and then ultimately gain control of a situation, they're going to figure out how to do that. Um, and oftentimes they're able to do it very quickly. So if um, they're online on a social networking platform, let's say, and are having conversations with different people or are putting out friend requests and people are responding and they're putting out these teasers, um, if they can just get pieces of information to learn more about, about us, um, they will utilize that information and, again, try to gain trust and ultimately use that trust to exert control and manipulation and um, other kinds of things to, to ultimately get people to do what it is they want them to do. And in this, the case that we're describing here, it's, it's something sexually explicit, which I think was the next, uh, or you know, sexual exploitation, which was kind of the next um, yep. term we use um, yeah. quite a yep. bit. Um, yeah, so sexual exploitation does not have to be um, in person. Um, you know, in, our, in the world of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, much of the work that we do involves um, crimes that were committed through technology where the offender, the perpetrator, never actually met the victim in person, and, but yet was able to sexually exploit 
that person through um, either displaying or showing explicit pornographic uh, materials to someone or having someone take those kinds of materials, those images and videos and send those, display them. Um, sexual exploitation can be narrations, words, um, you know, it's a crime to, to, um, to, to have a sexual, sexual conversation with a child, um, sexually based conversation. Um, trying to entice someone to meet somewhere can be a crime. So there's a lot of sexual exploitation that occurs that is not, it's not in person necessarily. Right. Well, I think that that's, when you, when you, as you're talking about this, it makes me think of um, the grooming process, that process being, you know, those, those pictures that you see the, the ropes tied, you know, people, when they, when they talk about sex trafficking or sexual exploitation, they particularly sex trafficking, they always have the pictures of the ropes around the wrists and things like that. And, and we, we know as advocates that um, many, most of the time, it's not a physical bonding. It's some, it's an emotional and a mental bonding, psychological bonding. And I envision that rope as being that psychological grooming process, just slowly wrapping those ropes around the ankles and the feet, you know, is a, so to speak, and, and just bonding them and, and, and capturing them, so to speak, getting them exactly where they want. And as you said, full control. So that's yeah, so you make a great point too. Um, I'm sorry, you, you make a great point because a lot of times as part of that grooming process, um, there are images, um, so someone will ask, and we're talking about children here primarily, but it can be adults too, um, but I guess for purposes of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, children, um, but we'll ask someone for images, and they might start out um, images in underwear, swimsuit, uh, bathing suit, those kinds of things. Um, if, if the pattern that they're, or the path that they're taking is part, part of the grooming process is someone who um, perhaps is exhibiting lower self-esteem. I'm not beautiful. I don't feel good about how I look. You know, my classmates um, make fun of a particular thing and I, I have an issue with that. And well, no, let me send, send me some pictures. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. And then again, gaining trust through, oh no, these are beautiful photos. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'd like to see more. These are, these are wonderful. And so mm -hmm. using that to, to kind of further it and take it to the next step, again, building that trust um, and then once you have either the photos or information about someone, um, that's where it, it shifts into that control side. And now that this person has these things that we can kind of start segueing into that next term you were talking about, yeah. which is sextortion. Yeah. And we do see that very frequently where someone has. Uh, typically, it's images or videos. They have those those files, and they'll say, "Well, I have these." And perhaps, again, just using the example of a child, child starts feeling uncomfortable. Says, "I don't. This isn't a good, good idea. I don't want to do this. I don't want to communicate with you anymore." And this person will say, "Well, I tell you what. I've got these photos. I've got these videos. Unless you send me more of what I want, I will." post these to a pornographic website. I will send these to your family. I will post them on social media. And um, it, it can be extremely difficult for a child to, and an adult really, to, to navigate that yeah. situation. Um, it's a lot of pressure and you have to know that there's someone you can turn to, to talk to about this, who can help you. And that's why I'm really glad you we're talking about the prevention side as well. It's very important that we talk to our children about resources available and that as parents and people who love them, whether you're a teacher or whatever your role is, um, that people can, children can talk to you and it's not the blame game. It's not yeah. um, diminishing or, or minimizing, you know, them as a person, as far as what they did, or they committed a crime. It's we're here to help you. We're here to help other people. Let's, let's, find out what happened here, get the information right. and find the people who are responsible for this. I, I think that's, I, I feel that that cannot be expressed enough. And I, anytime a parent calls me, contacts me wanting to just know 
um, basically, what what do I do? This this happened. I just I can't believe it. I don't know what to do. Um, one of the first things I I like to express to them is it first of all, this isn't your fault, and this isn't your child's fault. You you're a victim of a crime here. So. Um, they're going to use shame, you know, as you were just saying, that, that shame is so powerful that I see that with anyone who, whether it be a victim of sex trafficking that I've um, spoke with, whether it be parents of somebody who's been, um, whose children have been exploited online or, you know, any, any extreme in between, uh, you know, one end or the other, the, the shame element is just so powerful. And it not only keeps the child, like you said, that's such a great point. Um, what is a kid, how do they handle adult things? Like how do we expect them to handle such an adult situ situation as that? That's huge. And the only way for them to be able to handle something like that is to come to a parent. And the only way for them to feel comfortable to come to a parent is if we talk to them ahead of time and let them know that if something happens, we're not going to freak out. We're going to help you resolve the problem, basically. So, I mean, that's so important. Yeah, yeah I just... Um, I, I, I like to think, I know people, when, when, when the word sex trafficking is used, a lot of times people tune out because they think, or they, or maybe they want to think, um, something very dramatic and exotic and from somewhere else, different country from a movie. And you just said in the beginning of this presentation about sex, sexual exploitation, trafficking happening without a child really essentially ever leaving their room. They could, that could happen. And in fact, I read, a, I read a, um, a study one time, I think it was in, from Toledo, University of Toledo. I have it over here in my stack of papers. Mm -hmm. But saying that 42% of kids who met their trafficker online and were trafficked online never actually met their trafficker. So I know there's a lot of elements to that, but in essence... The, the point is that a child where a parent's thought process when they think sex trafficking, which you're going to give us kind of that definition in a minute, but when they think sex trafficking, which is what I look at is this line of continuum, the, the you know, every child starts at zero. If they're online, they, they have, they, they're there, they're on that line. And then it goes all the way to the trafficking element. So there's the exploitation can happen throughout there at all different points. And but sex trafficking tends to be the thing that people just think that cannot happen to my child. That cannot happen. I'm home. My child is home. They're safe at home. And if you could just give the the, def, the definition, kind of the legal element of that, and then also how how can somebody be trafficked without even leaving their home? Yeah, it's it's an interesting. No, that's not the right word, but it's a, it's an interesting concept because um, you're right, and so. I like to and actually have it in front of me because I don't want to miss any of the, the elements because um, I think once I, I read this, people will have kind of a broader understanding of, um, of what it is. So this is the, this is the um, statute, the crime trafficking of a child, which is a, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's a different statute than um, human trafficking, which includes adults or adult human trafficking. But the trafficking of a child, I think, will get, give you give folks the details or the information um, so trafficking of a child, whoever knowingly, now this is, this is the, some of the elements here, whoever knowingly recruits, entices, provides, obtains, harbors, transports, patronizes, solicits any child or attempts to do the same. Recruits, entices, provides, obtains, harbors, transports, patronizes, or solicits any child or attempts to. Um, that's a lot of things, as you described, that I'm um, so recruiting, um, enticing. I mean, um, and again, and then it's for the purpose of a commercial sex act. So what is the commercial sex act? Again, a commercial sex act could be sexual contact, sexual intercourse, sexually explicit performance, Strip club, stripping. Yep. I'm sorry. Like at yeah. a strip club or something like that type of thing. Sure. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Done for the purpose of sexual humiliation, degradation, arousal, or gratification for which anything of value is given, promised, received um, by any person. 
So Someone. by any person. Yeah. So you're right. It encompasses a lot of different things. And we have charged in this state um, many people for, in fact, we made an arrest. Um, this person has not yet been charged, but we made an arrest just yesterday on an individual who had been attempting to um, uh, purchase um, from parents their children for a purpose of, of meeting for um, sexual contact, sexual intercourse. So um, there was there was no in person there, but again, that's that person's being charged or going to be charged with trafficking of a child. Mm. So um, you're right, and the sexually explicit performance um, in, in the day and age of webcams um, and live streaming, this it can look like it can look like a lot of different things, and we have had people. Um, who have recruited, obviously have recruited um, children and never met, as you suggested, that it, um, yeah. that happens. They have never met in person yeah. the person who is trafficking them. It's hard for a parent to wrap their brain around that. Do, do you do you deal with the parents like how do, much do where they're they just can't believe like can't believe that you know how? I mean, I guess I, I guess let me re. Let me re rephrase that. Um, do you deal with people, and I'm not talking about people whose kids have been exploited, but do you deal with people as I do, I'm sure you do, but who just have to believe, they just cannot believe that a kid would send those pictures. They just cannot believe that the kid would actually go to that, that you know, they might send something in their bra and underwear for a girl, but they're never going to send uh nude picture to a stranger. I mean, people, grandparents, parents, I, I've talked to lots of them. They just cannot believe that they're a good kid. What can you say? And I hope we're not getting ahead of ourselves here, but, but, but what can you say to those people in a compassionate way really is how I look at it because I understand that. I understand that if you have, if you don't know the topic and you, and you haven't been involved in this topic, it's very hard. You're looking at this kid in your, in your house, this young kid, and you cannot imagine they would ever send those kind of pictures. But mm -hmm. what do you say to those people in addition to what you just said? You said the, the details, you said how grooming is, you know, what, how grooming works, but, but say something to try and convince somebody that yes, it could be your child, your, your good child, you know, and doing the air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, mean, no. I think all the kids are good. They're not, they're not, asking for this they're not asking right. to be exploited so how does it right. happen you know just right it's um you yeah there are certainly there are people who um they just find they find it so hard to believe that this is um that is possible and sadly there are people who are you know would blame uh, and do blame the victim for what has happened sad we, we, we um yeah um Obviously, there are. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's um, just try to educate and yeah. tell people that, you know, this is a real problem. There are people, unfortunately, in this world who want to exploit other people um, yeah. sexually, monetarily. You know, there are a number of different things, but um, there are people and they are very skilled at it. And um, this, the Wisconsin task force arrested 450 people last year in the state for this activity. And unfortunately there are, you know, there are that many people being arrested every year in the state. Wow. There are literally thousands and thousands of people being arrested across the country who are sexually exploiting children. Um, that's just sexual exploitation through technology. That's not in person. Um, you know, sexual assaults that are occurring. That's just, you know, um, so. Just a safe kid at home, a kid at home, safe at home in their bedroom. Correct. Is what you're saying. Correct. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just a matter of educating. And that's one of the things that we're really trying to do is just educate people on, on this topic, on this issue, and um, that it is very real. It is very real. And there are people who are, will find ways to try to exploit people. That's just the bottom line. There are people who are out there doing that and they're so very good at it. 
specifically the kids that are being exploited online, do you see a more vulnerable population in that, or is that kind of across the board? It's really across the board. It, you know, it really is. Um, all, you know, walks of life, all demographics, um, major urban Milwaukee, Madison, Green Bay, up to, you know, very, very, very rural communities, um, you know, children who live in sort of the traditional two parent homes, um, you, very wealthy families, uh, it, it runs the gamut. It's, um, as I said, the folks who are involved in this, these perpetrators of these crimes are very skilled at figuring out what it is that they need to, what kind of person do they need to be to this child who is, they're communicating with, um, they're so like good. Try to fill a, a void or a gap or gifts or, you know, um, the, showing them that that time to, you know, be that friend or, like I said, shoulder to cry on or. Sure. You name and it. boys and girls, I mean, you must see probably more girls, but do you see quite a few boys being exploited as well? Or how, what's that look like? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, yes, um, boys as well. Um, Absolutely. Okay. And just my brain automatically goes to, are those kids more, more um, groomed more on the gaming sites, would you say, or is it still whatever? I mean, is there a, oh, more... because yeah, there is. A, yeah. I, I, I would say yes. It depends on the kind of games. Um, yes. The, um, Boys tend to be more involved in um, some of the traditional kinds of PlayStation, Xbox kinds of games. Um, some of the online games. Um, yeah, I, I guess okay. I think about it. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure people think about that element, too, because I tend to I had girls. So I, I and they were not gamers. However, now I. Um, my husband's nephew is living with us, so not, and he's a gamer, and it really changes my perspective. And I pay more attention, and I talk to other people more about that. And I always, you know, it's just, it's scary. He's told me stories. Um, that's another, that's for another presentation. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. No, but you make a great point that um, when we talk about having conversations with our children, any kind of technology now, it's... Um, you're communicating with other people or there's there's that ability to do so very easily. And many of the games, the online um, or um, console games, that's that's a main, that's a primary component of the game. You're playing with other people yes, online. Right. I mean, so the, that's part of the game. Right, right. Um, who, who are the predators? Like, is there a textbook cookie cutter look or is it? What do they look like? Who are they? Yeah, no, I think we all have kind of a, a vision of what that might be, but it, there is not. There is not. Um, uh, young, um, uh, we've, um, children, children can be predators, um, you know. Uh, so very young to old, um, again, wealthy, you know, any sort of socioeconomic, um, there, there really is no... Um, there is no stereotype, if you will, of, of um, I will say that primarily men um, are the perpetrators of these crimes. It's um, so sure. that I will say that that is um, a common theme, primarily men involved, um, but women also. OK. Um, so without going through all the apps, because. I know people want to know what app is most dangerous and it is in, in my knowledge, you know, any app that has a chat platform um, can be dangerous, but is there, what are, what are the hot apps right now? And, and would you say that you see more exploitation? I'm going to just take a shot in the dark that it's on whatever is hottest at the time, but, but what is, what is your outlook on that? What is your perspective on that? So like the, the apps that are hot right now, and then where is a lot of the exploitation? Is there, is it happening more on one type of platform than another? Yeah, I, um, so the traditional social networkings, the Instagrams, 
the Snapchats um, because they are very popular. Um, so the, there's a there's um, we do see a number. So using those traditional platforms, um, I always chuckle because Facebook. A lot of people say that children don't use Facebook, and I, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> but until they do, so I'm not they sure. They are. Who, what children are using it because people laugh and they say children don't use Facebook anymore, but they do. Um, so okay. Facebook, Instagram, um, Snapchat, those are the big ones. Um, is TikTok uh, a big one right now? I mean, that seems to be everybody. It's extremely popular. We're not seeing, well, we're not getting a lot of information from TikTok right now. It's a, it's not based in the United States. Yeah. Um, but that is changing. So I just saw that Oracle and Walmart, I believe the purchase was um, approved, uh, that they're going to be purchasing TikTok. And oh. so then it will be um, domestic here in the United States. And so then subject to some of the laws that require wow. um, uh, require that information to be shared if they find out about exploitation on their platform. So I'm interested to see what will happen with that. Yeah. Um, I, I know that it's widely popular. Yeah. Um, that's really the trend right now is any sort of app that allows for that short form video. So, you know, the TikTok is, I mean, it's, it seems like you can't go anywhere in public now and see children doing the, doing a TikTok video somewhere in the mall or at the playground or, you know, wherever. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's constant. So yeah, I, and, and isn't it, um, I mean, a lot of times people will say, um, oh, my child doesn't have that app, that app, my child only has this. Um, but I have read or been told that a lot of times traffickers or people who are um, looking to exploit kids, they'll basically lure them to another, another app they'll en or encourage them to download a different app, you know, because parents are watching maybe one particular app. And they're not going to be watching another app that they don't think that they have or are, are on. So is that is that true? Is that a tactic that you see that they, they encourage them to transform from one app to the, keep them moving across apps? Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, there are a lot of apps out there that are in a, encrypted end-to-end -end encryption. So people feel safer using those, um, you know, text apps or you know, so many text apps also not have video capability. So, um, you know, Snapchat and um, WhatsApp, uh, you know, they have mm -hmm. video chat capability. And yeah. a lot of people who don't use them don't recognize that, but they absolutely do. Um, there's a lot of people who use Snapchat as their primary video conferencing platform. Okay. You know, Snapchat, it's, it's like, well, yep. never thought about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier uh, than the Switcher Studio, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, we do see that. So that's it's why it's so important to be having these conversations. And when you talk to children um, about using the device and, um, you know, apps that you're allowing to be on the device, whether you're using something like a family link or something through your um, provider or something that helps you kind of allow or not allow certain apps. Um, if you know what's on the device, um, have those conversations about the WhatsApp and all these things. And again, it's not because we don't trust our children. Right. We don't trust these people that are out there who are trying to exploit us. Right. You know, That's great. Trying to exploit me. There's people trying to exploit me. I get emails, um, spams and at work at home. I mean, it's, there's it's just the way it is. And so we have to educate about even email. Um, yeah, everything. It's not, not because we don't trust you. We just, we don't trust people that are out there there. I'm, I'm sorry. It's the world we live in, but there are people who want to exploit us and yeah. we can never be too careful because here's the ramifications of, you know, what could happen if our images are out there or information about us is out there. Right. That's such a great, I mean, I, I love that because, you know, mentioning using that language, even with our kids that, um, I always say it's not a trust thing. It's a love thing. I say that for parents yeah. to tell their kids. I mean, that's our job. It's our duty as parents. But also, as you just said, uh, you know, we're being 
solicited and, and, and attempted to be exploited. And many adults are being exploited, you know, whether it be financially or whatever. And um, I just had a conversation with a woman who drives local, the taxi here, and, and she's um, in, intersected on three or four different, I think three different um, possible financial exploitations of elderly. And she sure. knows these people. She drives them around. She asks questions when she picks them up. Where are you going? Why are you going there? What are you doing there? Just for conversation's sake. And three people, she's ended up, I think two different ones, she ended up taking to the police station because they already had been exploited. She just took them right over there to the local police station. The other one hadn't actually given any money yet. But um, so that's a great angle also. You know, this is not just kids. This is all of us. This is the world, like you said. So, okay, I want to keep scooting along so we have time for questions. So, um, so, so someone, I found something inappropriate on my child's phone. What do I do now? And I'm just going to say that, um, as I said, when I started just to, to encourage people to respond rather than react, because I reacted even with knowing this is a few years ago now, but even having, having knowledge and information about this topic, um, you can't anticipate the amount of, um, just the, the rage, just the emotions, the, the range of emotions when it is your child that somebody is trying to exploit. And um, so you a lot of times don't respond appropriately. So, so I think it's important to have um, a really uh, have the pl have a plan. So, so what, what do you do? What's the first thing you would tell somebody, a parent who calls you and says, Hey, I, I found some things on my kid's phone that I, that are not right. You know, what do you yeah. do? Yeah. Make point because we plan for um, fires and tornadoes. Um, you know, hey, here's our rendezvous point. Here's where we're going to meet. Here's what we're going to do. You know, don't go back for this, do that. And we talk about these things as families. If this, if something bad happens, yeah. you know, here's where we're going to meet. Here's what we're going to do. Here's, you know, all that, those kinds of things. Um, we need to have a plan for this too. You're right, because it's a very emotional situation. Um, and we only get one chance um, because this is something that's going to be impactful on, you know, our children, theoretically, for the rest of their lives, they're going to remember this and, and what happened. So um, take a deep breath. And I would say um, a lot of times um, or frequently there are parents who will text back to the, the, the person and, you know, hey, this is a child you're communicating with, you're committing a crime, don't ever talk to this person again, you know, and then just be done with it. Um, but uh, we got it's important to remember that people are not just targeting one person. I mean, there are there could be literally hundreds and we've seen that hundreds of people, thousands. We've seen thousands um, on some occasions where they're reaching out to many, many people to, again, try to exploit them. So it's very important not to communicate. Um, first call should be to law enforcement. I would contact local law enforcement, um, and if you're the, the, the town or county where you reside, um, you know, they should come and they should try to get information from the device to try to find out who is communicating with your child. Um, and it's also very important that this information be shared with law enforcement as soon as possible because there could be um, latency issues with the information at the service provider. So we need to get out preservation requests as soon as possible. Many companies are not retaining information um, very okay. long just because of a, it's a volume issue. So okay. they don't have the capacity to, and if they don't have a business interest in saving text messages or, you know, other chat or, or whatever on their servers, they, it, it serves them no business purpose. So they're getting rid of it on their, the server side at the company. So we need to preserve that information um, before it's inadvertently destroyed by, by the company. Um, so it's, it's imperative that local law enforcement is contacted as soon as possible. So um, if there's any information that could be gleaned from the phone or the tablet or the computer, um, that efforts can be made to try to figure out who this person is who's committing crimes. Child is a victim of crimes. Um, and, uh, again, so, so we can contact the service providers and make sure the information is retained so we can hold folks accountable for these criminal acts. These are very 
egregious acts and people should be held accountable for this. So I've heard this from parents. I've been, I've been, I've been there myself. Sometimes you're not sure if what you're seeing, I, th I think part of it is shock a little bit. It's almost like you lose a moment of com not common sense, but um, it, what if you're not sure of what the content that you're seeing is um, illegal or let's say bad enough to call to contact law enforcement? Is there some sort of thing that you or, or point that you say, this is okay, you know, this is nothing we can do about this, but this is where you should come in? Or is it just, if you just aren't comfortable with conversation, call anyways? Um, no, I mean, I think after you've had a conversation with your child and you've kind of made an assessment on, you know, what's happening, maybe it is like, hey, I just got a random thing from somebody and it's explicit or, or it's asking me for something or, and um, I've never had a conversation with this person ever before, but it's it's something's not right here. Um, there are other options. So the cyber tip line through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, Matt, check get... this out. I got to, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just have to, look at what I have. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Can you see it on your so, end? Absolutely, yeah, cyber tip line. Um, we get many referrals from parents or people who see things online and have reported it to the cyber tip line. The nice thing about that is that the analysts at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children will take the information and they'll kind of piece it together. They'll deconflict. Perhaps somebody else has reported this person. Um, they'll, they'll take steps to try to figure out where this person might be. Um, the other thing that I, I do also advocate is reporting that person through the platform. Um, I know sometimes oh, yeah. people say, well, if you report the person, they're just going to know that, um, you know, you know if, they're, if their account gets blocked, they're going to know that, you know, the, the, the police are onto them or something like that. Um, maybe, but at a minimum, the company will take steps to figure out what this person is up to. And if they see other things that were shared with other people, they too will generate a cyber tip and they will have much more information than mom or dad. Mom or dad aren't going to have IP addresses, um, you know, subscriber information or, you know, any content, the email address for, for account verification. The company has that and they will share that with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And from the law enforcement investigative perspective, that's great. Now we've got information from the company that will help us identify who this person is. Um, so perhaps they, they, and, and quite honestly, um, unfortunately people get banned and, um, disabled, their accounts get disabled with, with, it's not uncommon and it, it doesn't stop them from what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I re recommend reporting that person through the platform as well. Um, more specifically, do you, um, when, when, when reporting to law enforcement, do you suggest or recommend an avenue? Do they go just call the information non-emergency number or do they try and connect with a detective right away? It, what do you suggest? You, you, you have ICAC um, affiliates, affiliates in, the, in the general area. Do we contact somebody specific? That's the question. Um. You could look on, I mean, it's going to be dependent on where you live. Um, if you live in a smaller community, um, perhaps there's only one detective or maybe the sheriff's office has only three or two or three investigators. And so they kind of wear all kinds of different hats and they are also going to be the ICAC um, investigator. If you live in a more, um, I'll say urban or a larger kind of area with, you know, many more detectives um, or perhaps a patrol that is more engaged in kind of doing that initial investigative work. Um, it just varies, but I would, I would call the non-emergency number and depending on the time of day, if it's three o'clock in the morning, you're likely going to see a patrol officer uh, because many detectives are typically working at three o'clock in the morning. So a patrol officer, but, that patrol officer likely will call 
depending on what's happening, we'll call um, the detective bureau and advise them as far as what, you know, what they've learned from talking to the family and everything else. But um, we have established here in Wisconsin, we're, I think we're pretty lucky. We're in a good place. We have a very proactive law enforcement community with respect to this topic. Um, our task force is quite large. Um, on our website, we do have a map with counties and it identifies different uh, police agencies that are affiliated with the task force. And by virtue of that affiliation, they do have access to training um, to kind of help their, their employees learn more about ICAC and how to investigate it and you know, the right questions to ask and preservation okay. requests and those kinds of things to, to kind of help prepare them. And at the Wisconsin Department of Justice, we also do have investigators and okay. try to supplement law enforcement when, when needed or when asked to kind of help um, with some of the investigative processes. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to show um, to our audience. I'm going to show, I have the, website um, loaded, but I'm going to wait till the end just in case I have any technical difficulties. But I want to kind of breeze through that at the end so people can kind of get familiar. There is so much information on that website, on the, um, on the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force website, the uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice. And so I'm going to show you that website towards the end here. But um, all sorts of things. Uh, like um, community newsletters. You and I were just talking about that before I get that. And it's the one, this latest one was amazing on apps and the age requirements and why that's important. And there's podcasts and there's videos and, and all sorts of conversation, uh, conversation starters that you can have with your kids, uh, teens, just so much information, educational stuff. So we'll get, we'll get back to that in a second. So, um, and, and what you were just saying, Matt, about um, finding affiliates, affiliates in, in our communities. So across the state, there is information there, and I'll show people that information. Um, one thing that I have um, noticed is the emotional, the psychological trauma that this puts people through, the whole family. I mean, the kids... I think we, we get so wrapped up that we forget what kind of trauma this could have on them. Like you said just before, long term, like this is something that's going to affect them. They're going to remember this. This is a traumatic event for them. This is so unnatural or unusual as far as what happens in our normal everyday life. Getting, getting law enforcement involved and having, you know, very embarrassing things revealed. And this is all going to be very impactful. So um, do you recommend meant you know or do you, what what do you say to the parents regarding like the mental health element do you suggest like i'd like to suggest people to seek counseling i mean what is your experience with that do you try to encourage victims and victim families to seek counseling um i think we encourage them to to open their mind to all sorts of different things that are out there and um, I personally, um, I, I agree with you. I think it's very important. I think we all could need someone to talk to. And actually, we do require our investigators um, to do have to have mental health uh, wellness visits um, yep. every six months. So, right. I mean, if, if it's right for our team, I think it's right for one. Absolutely. Um, really yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I, I do advocate for that. I think, I think it's, um, it can be very powerful, very helpful very informative to help people kind of talk through and look at things from a different perspective and just, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what I'm hearing from you here so far is that um, internet crimes in general are just prolific. I mean, it's just happening a lot. You would say that's, I mean, that word is ridiculous, but you, it's, I know statistics, particularly on anything sexual, exploitation, trafficking, it's very hard on sexual crimes because we know that a lot of them are not reported and just for the shame element of it. Um, but I, I just, again, reiterating how common or how prolific, I don't know if common is the right word for what I'm trying to say, but in yeah. my, point, my point for saying it is trying to get people to understand 
two things really. Number one, that yes, again, it does happen in our communities, in our good communities, in the cities, and you know, wherever. But also that um, that there is a community of people who have also understand, you know, what you have been through because it is relatively common, for better lack of better word. Yeah. Yeah. Our I mean, our office alone receives literally thousands of investigative leads and tips every year. Thousands. That's just my wow. office. That's not wow. people calling the police departments locally right. direct that we never, that the Wisconsin Department of Justice never even learns about. So, I mean, just think about that. There are literally thousands and thousands of invest, of, of tips and, and leads and information coming into the state, tens of thousands. Um, our task force arrested 450 people last year. Just think of all the arrests that were made that did not get reported in through the task force. Um, I sure. mean, could be double that. I mean, thousands of people being, I mean, it, it is, it's, yeah. I think you're right. I think prolific is the right word. It's okay. sadly there, there's, um, this is a big problem. Okay. And that, and that's why from my element, from where I stand as an advocate and just a mom and, um, I'm not a professional therapist. I'm not a law enforcement individual. I don't work in social services, but um, I, I, I just, it's important. Another element, I mean, all of the elements are so important, but people I think also don't report because they don't feel anyone's going to understand. And so what I'm hearing from you is not only does law enforcement, I mean, not only do, do the other families that are being victimized understand, but law enforcement does understand this problem because they are seeing it. It's a regular part of their day. Yep, and we continuously try to educate our law enforcement um, partners as well um, okay. so that everyone in the agency, everyone in the organization, patrol, you know, dispatch, uh, 